I'm amazed how many people own stocks. Welcome to the Playing FTSE podcast. My name's Paul and each episode, me and the lads get together to talk about the stocks, stock market news and finance in general. Quick disclaimer, you shouldn't consider anything in this podcast as personal financial advice. If you need such advice, go to a financial advisor. And please remember when investing in any form, your capital is at risk. So sit back, relax, and let the lads fill you in with all the stock market news of the week. The sucker's going up. Welcome, everyone, to the Playing FTSE show. It's the start of a new tax year, so happy new tax year, everyone. Uh, Paul's not here this time, but Steve's with me. Um, And we've got a nice show lined up today. We're looking forwards at the new tax year and the upcoming month. We're looking backwards at the end of Q1. Um, And we've got a game as well, but before we get any further... Um, happy new tax year, Steve. How are you? Happy new tax year, everybody. Happy new tax year, Steve. Um, I, I guess I, I thought maybe growing up this probably wouldn't be something I celebrated, um, but here we are. Um, the ISA limits uh, have renewed and uh, there's £20,000 uh, worth of opportunities to be grasped um, should, you be able to, should you be able to make that deposit. But whatever you do, uh, it's an achievement. So, um, so yeah, well done, everybody. Um, so yeah, my week's been all right, Steve. I, I, I'm excited to get going again. Uh, I'm excited to actually have some money to buy things. Um, mm. How about you? How's how's your week been? It's been good. I mean, it was payday not so long ago, and I still got some money left from from that. So that'll be uh, a nice start to the new kind of ISA. I've been in my kind of spare time though, having a look at some of the competition in the podcasting world. Uh, sort of inadvertently, actually. So a couple of weeks ago, I went to a wedding, um, and having been to the wedding, it was about the fourth time I'd worn that suit, so I put it through the dry cleaners. Um, and that's uh, a kind of local one. Uh, I live in Oxford, for those who don't know. Um, and there's a nice eco dry cleaners called Oxwash, um, and they pick up your stuff and they'll take it away on their nice either bike or electric van thing, and presumably eco clean it somehow and deliver it back to you. But yeah, I got a text saying my order was successfully picked up by this person. While we wash your items, why not check out our podcast series, says my dry cleaning company. Um, so there's there's some pretty stiff competition coming down. Everyone's got a podcast these days, it seems, Steve. Mm. Uh, if you were a dry cleaning company and you had a podcast, and though we didn't rehearse this before, by the way, for anyone listening, um, what, what sort of things do you think you would put on your, your dry cleaning podcast, Steve? It, it would have to be methods of washing and uh, and how to get a red wine stain out of a carpet, I guess. Mm-hmm. Am I on the right kind of lines? No, um, okay. <laughs> but uh, your ideas are better than the ones that they have, I think. Uh, well, they might be or might not be. I had two ideas for what I would have for a, a dry cleaning um, podcast. One would be um, stuff we found in people's pockets uh, when That's we took their dry yeah. cleaning away. Like lost that, and that found. That I thought might be fun. Yeah, um, like all kinds of things that you might find after, I don't know, wedding nights and that sort of thing where people have stuck their suits in the cleaners. Uh, That sounded uh, like a thing I would have. It's not that either, by the way. But I also thought you could like have a a sort of general theme of airing people's dirty laundry uh, as a kind of episode theme. Um, And I'm also wrong about that as well, by the way. Uh, Basically what it is, is a series of um, interviews, as far as I can tell, with environmentally friendly entrepreneurs, more or less, which is... Uh, yeah, it's all right. I mean, no one really wants to listen to these kind of uh, business-themed podcast things, really. Uh, I'm much more interested uh, in the, what will be, no doubt be their spin-off after they hear this, airing people's dirty laundry, uh, and stuff yeah. we found in people's um, uh, pockets, and also um, how to get stains out of things and uh, washing basic washing techniques for people who want to clean their own carpets and so on. You know, I'm I'm thinking, in the hands of somebody like Bob Mortimer, you just hand him it, he looks in the pocket, and he comes up with a story (laughs) of what's happened with this thing. Mm. Alla, would I lie to you? Uh, Or if anybody ever listens to the podcast Atletico Mince, uh, which is probably Bob Mortimer at his craziest and and funniest. Um, Yeah, I think that would be hilarious. They have missed the trick. He is great, Bob Mortimer, isn't he? I mean, I don't blame Mm. them for not being Bob Mortimer. Very few people are. In fact... Pretty much there's only one of him. Uh, mm. But it's, uh, yeah, I feel I feel like there's missed opportunities there for um, a dry cleaning podcast, even if I commend the initiative of thinking, what do people want while we do their dry cleaning? I know, a podcast series, uh, mm. something like that. But um, yeah, that was one of the most interesting things that I found out this week. So it's been that kind of week so far. Uh, cool. Anyway, Steve, you've got a game for us. Me. I have. 
Um, so this game is sort of, and, and I actually said, um, uh, I messaged Steve to give him a little bit of a heads up on this because I knew we'd be, uh, no Paul. Um, but I actually told you the wrong thing because this game wasn't 12, 12 days of Christmas. This game was uh-huh. the, Brist- the Bristol Myers Squib Fat game. Which oh. I can't remember what that was called, which was probably why I was mess- messaging you calling it Squibmas. Um, yeah. But anyway, I don't have a, a name uh, or a title for this game, so we'll just call it The Disney Game. Okay. So I have ten facts about um, Disney. Um, you're going to give... Uh, I'll give you a multiple choice, Steve, so there, there's an opportunity for you to um, for you to guess. Um, and um, you just have to tell me which of these is the correct answer. Does that make sense? That makes sense. I was hoping that you were going to tell me some facts and I'd just tell you whether they were true or false, but never mm. mind. Uh, by the way, it was the Bristol Myers Squid Game. Uh, ah, that, was that was it, yes. Very, very pleased with that one, actually. Yes, very good. Mm. Um, okay, so we'll just start from the top because it seems pointless choosing numbers. Um, I think so. so. We'll start with the obvious place to start. What year was Disney founded? Was it 1915, 1919, or 1923? Hmm. Uh, okay, so I was thinking it was later than all of those, but now that you've said those, I uh, I was thinking sort of more Second World War than First, really. But let's try 1915, because if it's earlier than I thought it was, maybe it's miles earlier than I thought it was. You would be... <coughs> incorrect. No, hmm. it's uh, 1923 Disney was founded. Ah. Um... Yeah, the others are just a, a spot too early. Um, mm. Okay, so where was the first Disneyland? Was it in Paris, France? Was it in Orlando, Florida? Or was it in Anaheim, California? I was hoping you wouldn't put both of those last two there. Uh, so I very much doubt that it was in Europe, um, although I know that there is one there. Um, I... I always forget about the Californian one, for what it's worth. I've been to the yeah, Florida one. Yeah, everybody does. Um, yeah, and it, it didn't look... I mean, I don't know. It, I was about 11 when I went, so that's about two and a bit decades ago. Um, hmm. Uh, let's try... It's the one that everyone forgets, then. Let's try California. That is... Correct, yes. Mm. I thought you'd go for Orlando, Florida. It seems like the obvious choice, and I was shocked does, when I read it? it wasn't. So, um... So yeah, uh, interesting one. Uh, so the next three all follow a very similar theme. Um, what year did Disney acquire Pixar? Was it in 2000, in 2006, or in 2012? Hmm. Okay, so back to my story of the one time I've been to Disney. Um, I was about 11, to, I, was, I was whatever the youngest age you can still go, sorry, the oldest age, you can still go on holiday and be paid for as a child is so about 11 ish i think and that was part of the kind of rationale behind it right and if we're going to go to disney let's do it while we've still got at least one child uh, that we're paying for that's perfectly sensible thinking from what i can tell um and i remember there being some uh bugs life stuff there which was a pixar thing mm-hmm. um and i think sorry what was your second option there the first one was 2000 wasn't it 2006 or 2012 Right, so it was way before 2006 that I was going there, and I uh, they fully acquired them by 2000. I'm going to go with 2000 because there was a load of uh, Pixar-related stuff there at that point. That is... <coughs> incorrect. I think they mm. published for Pixar first before they acquired mm-hmm. them, so uh, they didn't actually acquire them until 2006. Um, okay, so same question again, but with Marvel. And this one might be fresh in your mind because I think Chris Hill mentioned it. I know Chris Hill mentioned it, but I don't know how old his daughter is, which uh, is the context he mentioned it in. (laughs) Yeah. Your options are 2000, 2006, and 2011. Okay. Um, So I probably lean 2011, but before I just finalise that one... um, your nice kind of distraction on telling me about the 12 days of Christmas had me trying to work out uh, companies and index that begin with certain letters and panicking about the idea that I might have to try and recall them (laughs) under pressure. So I've done entirely the wrong type of preparation for this quiz. (laughs) This is the first time I've ever tried to prepare for anything you've done, actually. I normally, normally you don't say anything, so I just, um, 
I have an idea it's going to be about some numbers, but that doesn't really narrow it down enough. This time I was thinking, oh no, it's going to be one of these kind of recall things of obvious things that suddenly become unobvious when you're under pressure. Yeah. Um, this is this is the opposite of that. These are not obvious things that uh, I'm feeling reasonably relaxed about the fact that I don't know exactly. Uh, 2011 was the third option. That's right. Yep. Let's try that then. Correct. Yep. That was, uh, I think Chris said it was just over 10 years ago when he swapped from AIG, the insurer, to Marvel. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he said actually it was just pre the financial crisis, wasn't it? So, uh, so yeah, there we go. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, same question. Um, this one is Lucasfilm. Was it 2012, 2013, or was it 2016? Oh, more recent then. That's interesting. I somehow thought that might be older because I just sort of thought... Lucasfilm is all the Star Wars stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, and I associate that as being really, in its kind of earlier incarnations, quite old. Um, but uh, it's a recent thing, huh? Um, 2016 seems really quite recent, so I might try and fade off that idea. Um, Scores-wise, I'm on two out of four so far, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, let's try... The middle one. That's all I got. Okay, you are incorrect. It was 2012 uh, they acquired Lucasfilm. Um, I'm not expecting you to know these, Steve. This is uh, kind of like your Bristol Myers Squibb uh, um, thing. It was all really useless information to an investor, I guess. But um... They're all interesting, though. They're all hmm. things that I kind of feel like I ought to have some idea of. I mean, I had an idea that they'd acquired all these things because I knew hmm. the Star Wars stuff was now Disney, even though I didn't associate it with it. But yeah. So I've got a couple more that might, you know, there's a couple more that I saw of business in, there's a couple more that are just interesting facts, but how mm -hmm. many members does the Disney family still have on the board? Is it two? Is it four? Or is it zero? Ah, so I had an instinct about this um, when it first, well, before you read out the answers here. And then when you started reading out answers, I thought I must be clearly wrong uh, because I was inclined towards saying zero. <laughs> Um, let's try zero. You are? Correct. Yep, it is mm. zero. I think the last one was Roy Disney, and I think he, he left quite quite a while ago. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so Disney breaks its, um, its revenue down by, in, into its four main segments. Um, so which of these is the biggest? Is it media networks? Is it studio entertainment, parks, and resorts? Or is it interactive media i'm feeling it's studio parks and resorts um they keep changing or they keep changing they've recently changed the way they break these down i think the other one is direct to consumer isn't it so it's the disney plus um stuff which i probably could have told you wasn't the answer but um uh studio parks and resorts so interactive media just just for everybody at home is uh, it is disney plus yes but they also have a gaming segment as well and mm -hmm. uh, any sort of spin-offs from any of the sort of disney franchise or even i suppose the star wars fran franchise would now fall under that media networks is an interesting one because people often forget they do own um 20th century espn Fox, and so on right espn yeah. ABC as well, and that is actually the biggest segment of Disney's business. Um, taking uh, it brings in about forty-three percent of revenue at the moment. So you are incorrect. Uh, okay, this one's an interesting one, um, and I think it kind of shows you, um, you know, one of the good sides of Disney, I guess. But um, so if you add together the price that Disney paid for Marvel, Pixar, and Lucasfilm, what does mm -hmm. it tot up to? 15 billion, 20 billion, or 30 billion. I thought you, for a second there, I, I paused and then realised, oh my god, I hope he, <laughs> I hope he doesn't think I'm not going to give him multiple choice. <laughs> That's exactly what I thought for a brief split second, yeah. I was thinking, you said something about multiple choice options here, you can't be expecting me to add those up in my head. Um, so, <laughs> uh, I panicked so much I didn't hear the multiple choice bits. It was 15 something 30? 15, 20, and 30, they're your options. Yes. Yeah. okay. So, uh, you said Pixar, Lucasfilm, and Marvel. So the three we've kind of covered. One of those, and they were, I think, all this side of the new millennium, we said. So, I would go with they picked up at least one of those relatively cheap. Um, so, let's try 20. Okay. 
you <laughs> would be incorrect. It's actually only, uh, I say only, 15 billion. 15, 15 yeah. billion for that lot. So they paid 7.4 billion for Pixar, uh, only 4.4 for Marvel, which when you think about, I think a couple of the Avengers movies might have done 4 billion at the box office. Um, and um, Lucasfilm, they only paid 4 billion. It was the cheapest of the lot. So, um, Bargain. Inc- incredible acquisitions, really. Um, I don't know why somebody else didn't buy them. So um, a joke we often tell, this is question number nine, is uh, that something has more goodwill than a Teladoc balance sheet. Um, what well, you say how often, much goodwill? Sure. <laughs> how much goodwill does a Disney balance sheet have? Is it seventy-five billion, seventy-eight billion, or eighty billion? Tough one because Disney strikes me as a company that has a lot of things on its balance sheet on the asset side that are not goodwill. It also strikes me as a company that would have largely depreciated those assets because some of them would be. Uh, significantly old in this situation. So um, I would try and reason my way out of this with the Disney market cap, but that might be a later question, so we'll save that thought just for a moment. Um, Let's try... You can use that if you want. There is no question on the market cap. Uh, Damn, I don't know the market cap, so I can't reason my way out of it with (laughs) the market cap in that case. Um, I thought I could safely float that because one of the questions was bound to be the Disney market cap, but never mind. Um, I I could tell you roughly what I think it is, but let's try it's about 80 billion or so you said in Goodwill was one of the options. Yep, you are... Incorrect, but very close, 78 billion. And the reason I think (laughs) for this is, um, from my basic understanding of of the way Disney works, is that essentially when they buy things like Fox and Pixar and um, Lucasfilms, essentially the the assets that come with that business are not real assets, they're not really worth anything, but Mm -hmm. uh, they're also intangible. Uh, They are worth something, but they're not physically worth something, if that makes any kind of sense. So what they do is they, hmm. they lump it into their um, into their goodwill section. So Disney also have an intangible yep. section, which is things that have been generated from within Disney uh, that, are, that are characters and stories and shows that you know that they that they own the IP to, and they have the goodwill, which I think is essentially the vast majority of that you could lump back into intangibles. Yep. Um, but yeah, that's 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 basically how the goodwill works for them. It's different with other companies. A lot of companies just say we've massively overpaid for this business, so we're shoveling half of it in goodwill, and at some point we'll mark down that goodwill probably to save on a tax bill. Um, but yeah, that's that's just how goodwill works. So the last mm-hmm. question: um, Everything oh, Money just did a just did a, a recent <laughs> Disney video. What PE did um, Paul from Everything Money? put in the high category for Disney. Mm, okay. Would it be... Sorry. 17, 20, or 23? Ah, so, um, I had an idea of what I thought the answer might be. Everything might have did quite a few Disney um, shows. They sort of do them quite frequently, either because the price moves or because it's just a popular click thing. Back. More power to them. Yeah, well, more power to them. That's fair enough. People want to click on that stuff. Um... I the number that was in my head uh, when you uh, before you read out the the kind of candidate answers here was eighteen. I thought it might be something like thirteen, fifteen, eighteen with the kind of general sort of median um, PE uh, for the sorry not the median the average PE for the S and P being something like fifteen or, or that kind of being a kind of general mean reversion number. Uh, so I thought maybe 18 might have been the high end. Let's try 17 is the high end. You would be... Mm. No, you'd be correct. Not incorrect. You'd be correct. So, uh, Steve, I forgot to add it up, but I think you got half of them. Uh, I got four or five, which is... I was going to take three as a kind of passing number here, because Mm -hmm. that's what you would get if you kind of just randomly guessed in the probabilities on these things. Well, I'd say Uh, you got four, and it's like the first year of uni. Yeah. Pretty much. As long as, you get, uh, as long as you get 40% off we go. Yeah, I got 40% and I'm absolutely wasted uh, at the moment as a result <laughs> of it 90% of this stuff. Um, nice game, Steve. That was fun. Good. Cool. Glad you enjoyed it. How did you guys get on at home? Let us know in the comments section. 
Hmm. Someone last time said they had a. They were hoping they would beat me, but I put a late run in in that last game you had that I was guessing wildly at. And hmm. oh my good, uh, the quotes game actually, where I made a horrible mess of the ones that I ought to have known, and then lucky yeah. guessed my way into the ones that I didn't really yeah. have much of a hope with. Um, but yeah, that was good fun. Cool. Okay, on to our next thing. Um, we're going to have a little look backwards, uh, first of all, then, I guess. We're we're kind of just at the start of Q2. There's earnings coming up. Um, but looking backwards at sort of Q1, um, I'll kick us off. Uh, so at the start of the year, I announced a couple of uh, ambitions for investing, kind of New Year's resolutions, as it were, that I wanted to kind of get better at. Uh, one was thinking more about my investing performance at the level of businesses rather than stocks. So rather than thinking, I've done really well because my portfolio has gone up, thinking I've done this because these companies have made this much money. And I think I'm doing okay on that one for the moment. I felt myself genuinely improving there. Uh, I also said that I wanted to do less selling because when we talked about our regrets or our mistakes or so on, um, I know we have a, a midweek mistakes or regrets or worst buys video coming out. Generally speaking, our mistakes and things that we regret tend to begin with selling this at this or something mm. uh, they're nearly all sell-sided things right we don't usually regret things we've bought we don't usually regret things that we even didn't buy and just thought well i didn't i didn't see it was there so i didn't go for it but we do tend to think i sold that and i probably should have just sat it out a bit and then it would have done much better um so i had a ambition to be less kind of sell enthusiastic uh, at the start of the year, I had 18 positions in my portfolio, and I've since sold six of them, um, which is, I would give myself probably a D minus on that particular thing. Uh, so having turned over a quite a substantial amount, and I've added in three new things, I'm all right with adding stuff, uh, and added quite significant amounts to other positions I have, so I guess I've mainly consolidated. Um, but I've been a bit kind of sell heavy, I think. In some cases, I think it was, in most cases, I think it was justified. But um, Steve, what do you think about your kind of Q1 performance? Yeah, so realistically, I had very similar goals to you. Um, I had a pretty shocking um, running, well, pretty shocking start of the quarter, really. I didn't really have an awful lot of fluidity to play with because... My portfolio by that point had um, had pretty much had the balls kicked out of it. Um, it had fallen um, about nineteen thousand by that period. So I basically that was it wiped off pretty much all of my profit at that point. So that was the that was my lowest uh, my lowest point was the beginning of the quarter. So uh, one of the things I've learned over the years of investing that sometimes you feel frenetic and you're looking for something and you think well my stock has fallen that much and perhaps my confidence is a bit shaken in that but this stock has also fallen so much so perhaps i should get out of this one and, and get into that one and i've always learned that when i do that it's almost always the wrong decision um so i practiced really what i preach which is that in vast majority of cases the absolute best thing to do is nothing um so this quarter i've I've really not done an awful lot. It was only in the last um, week, I think I announced it on either the week or the week before's podcast that um, I'd sold Nextera. Uh, that's the only major sellout of my portfolio. I had reduced my position down in Bristol Myers Squibb because I've got an average price in the low 50s on that and it was up in the high 70s, which, you know, for a stock like uh, Squibb is, is big movement. And also because uh, that position had really, really outgrown um, where, where I really wanted it to be. And um, I, all I've done is reallocate the money just to smooth out some of the positions and, and buy into prices that have gone down a bit. So since that's happened, uh, I'm just looking quickly now. Uh, this quarter I've recovered about 4.5k back on on my portfolio, which is an, as nice a finish to the uh, the tax year as I, as I could have asked for, really, um, considering the circumstances. Uh, I have recently added... Um, Cadence design systems into my pie and Sartorius and just started two small positions in that. So at some point I'll uh, I'll bring some deep dive and research into them because I think they'll be two really interesting companies uh, to talk to you about and probably two companies you don't know an awful lot about. But in terms of this quarter, it's been a quiet one, Steve. It's been a quiet-ish one on my side in the main in that there's been long periods of not doing anything where I've done quite well at my just sit and ignore it um, a, a desire, basically. Mm. It's just sort of two... Uh, basically, you can break down my cells into kind of three distinct events. One was 
realizing or finally i guess facing up to the fact that i'd probably made a bad decision on boston beer company um Hmm. which uh i decided eventually i'm not sitting around waiting for this to recover it may or it may not i'm ripping the band-aid off that and calling that a bad job and we Mm -hmm. all make mistakes uh the other was lockheed martin shooting up quite a bit um in the russia ukraine situation that pushed in a way that i wasn't expecting and i did eventually take myself out of that after uh, a little while of thinking about it and the other one was uh meta's earnings driving its stock down we'll come back to that in a little bit but that persuaded me that i should probably try and clear some funds to get in there because this late in the kind of financial year for us it's not easy to just add more funds and start new positions and so on. If it was in the case of thinking, if you want to buy this thing, you have to sell stuff, mm. basically. Um, so I've got a couple of new positions in there, but um, the biggest of them actually City Group. And as I look at my kind of portfolio now, it's mainly no changes at the top end of things. So my biggest three positions are Berkshire Hathaway, Amazon and Squibb. I haven't done anything buying wise to them in the last quarter at all. Just kind of left them there. And Berkshire Hathaway has done really well, and Amazon has not, in fairness, over mm. the last quarter. Uh, and Squibb has done pretty well as well, which has pushed them uh, into slightly different order from where they were before. But uh, that's kind of, it's been sort of three very specific things that's got me suddenly whacking the sell button uh, on stuff, I think. Hmm. Yeah, just looking at my allocations now, um, I don't really think there's too much that's changed. Um, I reduced down. Um, an Amazon position in the quarter before, so that that sits in third place. Um, ASML in second, and Alphabet in first. I think that's probably been there for quite a while now. See, I reckon you've been seeing that for a few quarters now on, on my portfolio. So, um, yeah, really nothing nothing to report. Um, I'll certainly be looking to add to uh, Alphabet and Amazon over the over the coming tax year. Um, there's Netflix as well to add to. Um, AdGen at the moment is still a little bit. Still a little bit too high for me. And then I've got things like uh, Disney, which I'll be looking to buy more of. Squib, I'm happy to sit on. Salesforce, I'll be buying more of. And companies like Intuit, I'll be buying more of. So there's definitely room for me to add to my top 10 there. Um, I just think uh, one of the things I'm going to practice this year is just a little bit more patience. So I'm going to force myself to uh, only deposit the uh, evenly over the 12 months rather than lump it all in and spend it like a crazy man. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah I've got to pause for that and I'm also going to try and practice just a little bit more because cash does tend to burn a hole in my pocket in a portfolio it's, it's one of my ultimate weaknesses um, something I've really got to work on and hopefully this, this helps me I find that too I'm starting to find that just sort of touch wood I've been a little bit better at having cash burning holes just lately and I've managed to do a better job of of keeping it there and not forcing things that I don't think are there to be forced. I've actually had the opposite a little bit. I've slightly got myself stuck and anchored uh, from the drop that we had sort of mid to early March. Mm. Uh, and now thinking, well, that's, I don't I want to buy it now. I bought it like 10% ago. Mm. Uh, the stuff's come back a bit, but I, I will get over that thought. Okay, let's, well, we're moving our way forward here. Let's, let's have a look at sort of um, Q2 in that case. And uh, it's April. You've got part of your... Um, annual money to invest you're not going to chuck it all in like a crazy man but where will you um chuck some of the stuff that you're uh looking at deploying uh so the first stock on my list is um it's a stock it's a it's an lsc stock or it's an aim stock Um, so this will be a shock and horror to everybody um the people from uk are talking about uk stocks um its ticker is kws and it's called keyword studios it's um an interesting little company on the AIM. AIM. I've done a little bit of a deep dive here. Its results came out um, last week, so uh, I've got all those for you as well. Um, so yeah, here goes. So, uh, keywords. It's um, an international technical and creative service provider to the games industry. Um, it's been around a while. It was established in 1998, and it now has about 70 facilities across 23 countries. And they're sort of strategically located where their customers are. So they've got Asia, Australia, the Americas, and um, and across Europe as well. Um, so generally, they provide uh, integrated art creation, marketing services, game development, testing, localization, audio. Uh, and player support services across um, over 50 languages and uh, over 16 different game engines. And they've got a pretty 
pretty hefty blue chip client base. Um, they reckon they've got 950 clients across the across the globe, so pretty big. Um, so I was looking at the video game market as well today just to make sure that's still growing. It is. It's expected to grow at 9% per year. Um, they estimate their TAM, and for whatever reason, they exclude China. And I've never fully understood that um, because uh, Tencent is one of their customers. But they think the TAM, excluding China, is $35 billion. I wonder if that's got something to do with the recent crackdown on, on um, playing time in, in China. Um, but anyway, so strong market position. Uh, they provide services to 23 of the 25 biggest game developers. Um, so the customers that you'll know are customers like uh, Activision Blizzard, uh, Bandai Namco, Bethesda, Electronic Arts, Epic Games, Konami, Microsoft, Netflix, Riot Games, Square Enix, Supercell, Take-Two, Tencent and Ubisoft. I think that's probably the laundry list of the best game developers around. Um, so these guys... One of the things that, that really stands out about them is they're absolute acquisition masters. Uh, they've integrated over 50 uh, acquisitions since IPO. Um, and their recent acquisitions have been focusing on um, marketing services, which is quite interesting because that is something that um, game developers often lack. And it is a little niche that they can, uh, they can grow into. So um, with their acquisitions, like I said, they tend to acquire companies close to where their big customers are because uh, localization and broadening um, is really, really important to them. So it's not growth by acquisition, although I guess it is as well. It's kind of broadening localization and growth by acquisition. So I'll give you a quick rundown of their results. They were, they were really impressive, um, I must admit. So they report in euros because I think they're actually based in Ireland. Um, they are, yeah. So... Revenue is up 37.1%, and it was just the first time they've actually got over 500, euro, uh, 500 million euros in uh, in a year. Um, they reckon organic growth made up 19% of that, so that was quite interesting. But I suppose once you start, once you've, once you've integrated a company, uh, I suppose that growth kind of becomes organic. <laughs> um, so they report profit before tax. It's a weird metric, um, but it was up 2.1% on last year to 16.8% overall. And they generated about 60 million in free cash flow. So uh, in the year, they completed six acquisitions. Uh, most of it was game development and marketing services, uh, as I described earlier. They pay a nominal dividend, Steve, under 1% yield. So it's something to get false juices flowing. Yep. Um, they've recently announced that they're now aerated by MSCI ESG, if you care about that, and I would argue you shouldn't. Um, <laughs> Guidance for the year was essentially that this momentum is carrying on into next year. There's going to be some reduction in their PBT profit before tax margin um, due to a little bit of increased capex. I think they've benefited quite well from work from home, and I think they kind of see that coming to an end uh, quite across a lot of their Western developers. Um, so the main risk that I can see is that the top five customers make up about thirty percent of the revenue. So in an in an industry that's consolidating, uh, that could make things tricky for them because. People like Microsoft buying a company like Activision Blizzard, that brings a whole a whole breadth of studios under Microsoft. You would think that before going outsourcing to keywords, there would be a likelihood that you try and tap up some of those Activision Blizzard studio, uh, studios that you, that you want. So that, that could be a potential issue for keywords. Um, but yeah, they would counter that by saying, uh, well, Microsoft already uses, they've got an account with us. So um, I don't suppose they'd be too, too displeased by that. But yeah, is there anything, Steve, that jumped out for you when you looked, you looked through them? I did have a good look through them, actually. Here's a couple of things. First of all, I thought this this felt to me like a very prototypically you type of stock, for what it's worth. Um, mm. Partly, I think, I kind of associate this as a an industry, by which I mean sort of gaming in general, that you're quite a fan of. So mm -hmm. uh, I think you've historically owned Nintendo. Netflix is heavy on gaming. You own Tencent at the moment. I think they've been the main victims of the kind of screen time uh, restrictions in China. Yeah. Uh, and here's one thing that, okay, so when we think about this kind of podcast and how we all fit together, if we're slightly lazy about labels, we call you the kind of growthy guy and me the value guy and Paul the dividend guy. And I think all three of us kind of just recoil a little bit at being pushed into those boxes because mm -hmm. we don't perfectly fit into kind of prototypical versions of that. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing that, um, a certain type of value guy that I don't think I am uh, needs to kind of sit up and take notice of. I was looking at this company share count over the last decade and its shares have roughly doubled from what mm. I can see of it. Uh, and there are definitely, uh, there's definitely a kind of rise in popularity in the sort of everything money type uh, style of investing, which says rising share count is bad because it's diluting you. And that itself is perfectly true. 
But as a result of growing their share count by roughly two times, I noticed their revenues grown by about 40 times, I think, mm. which means that you're left with merely a 20 bagger. Uh, if you um, think about it in revenue terms and factor in the share count there. And, I mean, when I think about these kind of things and I think, okay, I don't like companies diluting particularly. I view that negatively, other things being equal. But if there's an opportunity to dilute me by half and raise the revenue you're going to make by 40 times, I think I'd probably like most of my companies to take it, uh, mm -hmm. to be perfectly honest. It's... Um, we need to grow somehow. Uh, a company of Keyword Studio size, which is sort of a couple of billion market cap, I don't think I want them to be doing it via debt. Uh, and I looked at their debt and it was pretty good from what I saw of it. It looked like it was coming down reasonably well, but that's what I'd expect in a, a company this size. Um, so I think there's some smart growth going on here. You called it growth by acquisition, which I think is what it is, but it looks to me like it's been pretty cleverly done. Uh, what i kind of wary of in some cases is where the rate that the shares are growing is faster than the rate that the revenue is growing because that worries me a bit uh, mm -hmm. if there's no sign that things are going to grow organically afterwards. I guess the question with a 2 billion market cap, is this in your risk on or risk off section? It feels like a prototypically you investment, but it's on the small side in terms of company size. It's somewhere in the middle. Um, I think yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's in the transition between, because it's a profitable business now and I think it's pretty much... Yep. I think we're in the sort of like we'd be we'd be quite comfortable to say that barring any craziness, this is going to be a profitable company now from now until until the end. Um, so it is at that point it begins to shift out of my you know now my growth area because it can start to be valued by a traditional model. Um, so yeah, it's somewhere in the middle at the moment. Like shares outstanding, increasing, like you say, it, it does worry you with some companies, uh, but with Keyway Studios, it, it, it's it's not a problem. And I think they're following a model um, which I first saw in a Canadian company called Constellation Software. I don't know if you've ever come across that one, Steve. And what they right. do is they take um, small, young um, tech SaaS companies, bring them under their umbrella and transform them into um, basically huge money makers. And Constellation Software has been uh, one of the greatest market beaters for the last, I think, 20 years now. Um, something I've begged um, Trading 212 to put on because it does have an ADR. Uh, unfortunately, that ADR only trades hands 162 times in an average day. And I've never fully understood why. Um, but yeah, they said to me, there's, there's sometimes there's things with a little bit of liquidity that we sort of um and are about. This has no liquidity. <laughs> <laughs> so um, but yeah, that's Keywords' model. I think they're a fantastic little company. Uh, I saw that on their earnings, they were up about 8 or 9%. I still don't think their valuation is massively egregious, and I think with all um, companies that are growing at the sort of rate that they are, those numbers come down really, really quickly. Cool. So I've also got a FTSE one. Uh, well, I've got a UK stock. Mine's actually a FTSE 100 stock uh, that I am interested in. It's a fairly straightforward business to understand, I think. It's called Howden Joinery Group, um, and it provides kitchens and stuff to trade suppliers, which is... Hmm. The kind of thing I associate with your area of expertise, although not necessarily kitchens specifically. Hmm. Uh, so they break their business down into three segments. Uh, they have what they call their kitchen segment, where they provide worktops and sinks and floors and stuff like that. Uh, their appliances segment, where they uh, source coffee machines and dishwashers and ovens and other appliances, presumably. Uh, and they also have a kind of joinery business, which is stuff like door handles and furnitures and adhesives. Um, and here's why the kind of disclaimer I had was particularly important here. Uh, I think this might be a company that has some short-term headwinds ahead of it. Um, raw materials, supply chain disruption, all these kinds of things. Added to that inflation, limiting discretionary spending, especially on products rather than services. I think these might be a sort of nuisance in the short term, but I think the business is in pretty good shape and it's pretty well placed to handle them. So I think this is a something I'm looking at buying in April, I may well be looking at buying this all through the summer uh, for what it's worth. So I'm not going to go too mad just for the moment. I'll keep looking for opportunities if they're there. But um, there's a kind of, so there's a bit of a macro headwind, but here's the kind of um, value investing-y stuff then, since I am our quote unquote value investor. Uh, this company has pretty good growth on retained earnings. So if you look on the balance sheet of a company and you look under the shareholders equity section and you kind of click probably a drop down link or something like that, you will see retained earnings. That, but that number you'll see going up year on year because it's a cumulative number. 
So it's not like they're just in, uh, saving more and more of it each year. But you want to see that number moving forward. Uh, it will be added on to the previous year. And that's a kind of interesting metric because you want to see your companies retaining earnings, compounding earnings and growing in that kind of way. Uh, this company does pay a dividend of a sort. So tick that box for Paul. But I don't think it's a particularly attractive one. It might be about 2% or something. Mm. It wouldn't be. I'm not sure it would be a kind of dividend enthusiast thing. But what it has been doing is lowering its share count fairly steadily over the last decade or so. Um, and yeah, I'm sort of seeing a fair bit of supply chain disruption here. Wix, I know, are doing bathrooms and their lead time is uh, something around mid-2023 before they're getting around to anything on mm. that sort at the moment. Uh, Valuation-wise, 4.8 billion market cap, trades at about 15 times earnings, um, and the debt and, uh, their debt is more than covered by their cash which means that I think you're probably getting about a 6 to 7% business return kind of out of the gate. That will probably dip a little bit as prices go up, although they may be capable of pushing them through. Um, but I think there's room to grow here. But I think this is quite attractively priced at the moment, and it's got a fairly strong balance sheet, so I don't see them running into too much trouble here. Uh, you heard of these, Steve? Yes, I have. I had a look uh, over their stats today as well, and uh, I saw that they're... They've just authorised a buyback as well for about 5% of their um, stock, which is a pretty hefty buyback. Um, mm. One of the things I noticed um, that quite sort of jumped out as me, you know, I like a margin. So I was looking down all of their margins and seeing margin expansion, which is quite surprising when their input costs theoretically should be rising. And uh, I had a quick look down their supply chain and realised that they actually manufacture quite a lot of the items that you need to, to make your kitchens, make your, um, make your cupboards and what have you themselves. Which mm. is interesting because if they're putting their prices up with the market and are manufacturing a lot of things themselves and not actually seeing rising input costs, then uh, they might, and this is one of the problems with being a public company, is they might be seen as nickel and dime in their customers a little bit because um, if your margins are going up and your costs aren't and you're just putting them up because the market are, um, you're a public company, that's pretty easy to find out. Um, so yeah, uh, interesting. I think um, I think they're a good company. I've, I can vouch for their um, the kitchens. They're good quality. And uh, one of the things I've noticed is that the the price they're they're going to be able to put their prices up some more because um, basically anything that's melamine coated, the um, the vast majority of that is made from um, products that are supplied from either the Ukraine or from Russia, and for obvious reasons, it's very difficult to get supply of that stuff at the moment. I want to call it urea, but I think urea is the stuff that you pee out. I don't yeah, think that's what it is. Uh, but it's no, there's fairly like good that. supply of that at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> Whatever it is, anyway, I know that's in short supply um, because we're getting uh, we're getting told that from our suppliers as well. So, um, but if they've got a different a different way of getting it, and uh, they obviously have pricing power, it definitely shows they've got pricing power. Um, yeah, more power to them, really. If anyone's interested in this stock and interested in looking into it themselves, here's a question for you that I haven't managed to find out the answer to. Uh, I still got a little bit to do on the kind of competitive landscape here, but when we were talking about this off air, the three of us, uh, Paul asked me what this company has to do with Screwfix, because every Howden's kind of warehouse appears to be within about 10 feet of a Screwfix. Um, and I checked, and he's right about that, from what I can see. Uh, I went past one the other day in Reading, and sure enough, there was a Screwfix just around the next corner. I didn't manage to find out the answer to this by uh, Googling. Uh, when I tried to kind of find out, all I discovered was, I think, a Screwfix employee joined Howden's or something like that, but that's it didn't necessarily take all the kind of uh, buildings with him, uh, from what I could see. So, if anyone knows the relationship between Screwfix and Howden's, I'd be interested in hearing a bit about that. Do let me know in the comments if you want to have a dig into a kind of UK, possibly inflationary, headwinded consumer cyclical kitchen company. So, I don't know the answer to this, but my answer would be as follows. Screwfix are owned by Kingfisher, <laughs> so I don't think there's any intrinsic mm. But Howden's, I don't believe, sell the components that you need to put stuff together with. And Screwfix uh -huh. do. So I think it would make sense to have, uh, for Screwfix's point of view, to put themselves near your Howden joineries and things like that, where they can pick up the components uh, and the fixings and the glues and what have you to, to put things together. That would be my guess. Yeah, I know Howden's do at least a range of adhesives. I'm not sure they do screw, uh, literally screws and that kind of thing. So that might well have something to do with it. That might just be smart placement from um, Screwfix. But yeah, that's, that's interesting. Okay, Steve, anything else? 
I have, yes, another company I am looking at. Um, I do feel like I've, I'm anchored to $88 on this one, and it's not $88 anymore, um, but it's Match Group. And I think hmm. pretty much everybody uh, will have heard of Match Group, but probably not uh, the sort of companies that it owns. So they own a portfolio of companies, and all of them operate in the dating space, the online dating space, in, in one way or another. So the biggest brands in their portfolio are um, brands like uh, Plenty of Fish, Match.com, obviously, Hinge, OkCupid, uh, and of course, the current ju uh, jewel in their crown is Tinder. Um, so originally, um, Match was like a, a, a hard paywall style dating system. It had really low adoption rates. And uh, I think you'll probably remember, Steve, growing up online dating had a bit of a stigma attached to it as well. Um, it wasn't it wasn't looked upon very favorably. However, I think Match.com are the sort of pioneers and the last couple of generations, they've kind of adopted online gen uh, online dating as, as a way of meeting new people and this has eroded at the stigma. So it means that Match.com can sort of branch into new areas now, things like video chat into um, AI and AR uh, and, and launch things like community-based experiences. So um, I just had a quick look through their last earnings report and there's some really interesting facts in there. So uh, in the US, 44% of all singles have used a dating app. And uh, that number stands at 61% for the 18 to 24 of last year. So this is a trend that's definitely growing. Um, Match sees this growth, not just in the Western countries, but also abroad in places like the Middle East, uh, Asia Pacific and Africa. That's still lagging well behind. And that's probably due to connectivity as much as anything. And, and obviously, uh, and, and just simply having access to it. But they are definitely lagging behind. So um, growth, I would say Match.com is what you would call a proven growth story now. Um, revenue and operating income has increased 22% and 24% respectively over the last five years. Um, revenue at last year was just under three billion. Um, they generated adjusted net income of over a billion. That's when you sub back in um, things like stock-based compensation and things like that. Um, so strong margins. Um, these can ex these these could compress when they expand to those territories because, as we've seen with people like um, Netflix, um, you obviously can't charge a full subscription rate to somebody in India because it's it's quite a lot of quite a lot of the salary. Um, so valuation-wise, we're looking at about a thirty billion um, dollar company forward p expected to be around the 30 mark so it's not exactly cheap um but as with all growth companies these numbers often move faster than we'd expect uh, especially with a company that has pretty strong margins like this um the main risk that i can see is that um digital natives can be quite fickle uh and they can um and I guess as fast and impressive as Timber's ra uh, Tinder's rise has been today um its decline could be just as spectacular um i guess if I was going to counter that, Match would tell you they've had loads of products that have declined in popularity, but they always had the next one in their portfolio already. Um, so yeah, that's that's one I'm really interested in at the moment. Steve, is that anything there for you? Uh, this struck me as kind of the opposite of Keyword Studios a little bit, actually. That struck me as a fairly, uh, a very much a you type of story. I, can, I look at the balance sheet, I see all numbers going up, everything's reasonably clear and straightforward on this have, have match group acquired something in the last year or so i thought i was looking at their statements and thinking they've made an acquisition of some sort i could I be wrong about that the last thing they acquired was i think it was a, a um asia pacific app which name its name escapes me at the moment uh, -huh. uh but i think it's a video chat um it was more video focused chatting service because i think that is the trend uh in that region yeah, it's interesting. I, the people that I know that are now on kind of dating apps, they tend to be highly unbrand loyal about any of this stuff. I mean, they're yeah. basically happy to kind of carpet bomb sign up to pretty much all of them, whether it's Tinder or Plenty of Fish or OkCupid okay or Bumble. Or, I mean, they all have slightly different things about them, right? Um, yeah. But uh, generally speaking, people are sort of fairly happy to just try and get to as many people as they possibly can. Yeah. It feels like none of these has really managed to get a big advantage. Is the idea that Match does well by just kind of owning a lot of them, basically. Well, it currently has 10 million uh, paying subscribers, um, mm -hmm. Match.com, I believe. So um, it's got quite a lot of a lot of people on board. So I guess I guess that is the idea, isn't it? I guess you go where the fish is. Um, <laughs> so yeah. it was HyperConnect. That was the company. I was, I was trying to figure out HyperConnect they bought last year from a uh, South Korean mm -hmm. company. Interesting. So uh, this is a kind of classic network effect uh, thing, right? I mean, these apps yeah. are popular because that's where people are, and the fact that there's more people out there makes it more attractive for more people to join and so on. 
I guess I always wonder with these sort of network effect things, and we'll come back to this again in a moment with my last one. Um, I feel like they kind of go backwards as fast as they go forwards, at least some of the time. If people start leaving, the thing becomes exponentially less impressive or less attractive as well, because yeah. uh, fewer people uh, being there means that there's less of a reason for me to be there. So I end up leaving as well and so on. Um, I, neither of uh, both of us were married last year, of course. Um, uh, were you last year or the year before? You were last year, uh, right? Yeah, last year, yeah. Um, so neither of us knows anything at all about these anymore. But um, I, based on what I hear about these things, do you think there's a kind of competitive advantage to staying in front here or something that lets match kind of keep the competition away? Uh, yeah, I think there almost definitely is. I think Match.com, mm -hmm. I, you know, I think the, there might be something different with Tinder. Tinder seems to have a lot of staying power. Um, I mean, it's even got things like subreddits dedicated to it. So this one seems to have really... Um, it really seems to have got under the sort of skin culturally. Um, so I'm, I'm quite interested to see, I think Tinder is, well, I called it the jewel in the crown. I think it really is the jewel in the crown. I think it's got legs. Um, I'd be really interested to see in, you know, you want to fast forward five years and invest in all the time and just say, I wonder what Tinder's doing. You know, that's one of the things I would look at mm -hmm. um, because I think it, it is really interesting. Um, so yeah, network effect, but with fraught with worry, I think. I think this is one of those stocks that Chris Hill told you about that if you, if you're waking up in the middle of the night, you've probably, uh, you know what I mean? You've, you've probably got too much risk. And I think Match.com putting too much money into it um, is is a problem. It will, would be a problem. One of the other things I noticed as well is that by them buying as many and always trying to stay in front by continuously buying all of these up-and-coming uh, dating apps is that they're getting uh, a lot of attraction, uh, a lot of attention from the um, anti-competitive people. Uh, right. who are starting to spot that why is it every time a dating company gets any traction match.com are already sniffing around it and that could be a potential worry down the line because you would hate to be not allowed to make any acquisitions and somebody starts stealing your market share but for now mm. i don't see anything that's going to take um take too much uh, away from match.com and i think it's probably a pretty good hold for the next sort of five to ten years be interesting to see how that one goes. I thought that was a less obvious one uh, from your style for what it's worth. I thought uh, Keyword Studios absolutely screamed out at me as your kind of thing. Mm. Match.com, I was, yeah, a little more surprised by. So I'm really interested to see how that one goes. Cool. Okay, then. So last stock, then. It's one of mine, and it's similar in some ways to Match Group. It's another network effect company that has been attracting a bit of kind of antitrust attention, although it's subsided a little bit lately. Uh, this one's Meta Platforms, which uh, every self-proclaimed value investor has been crawling all over lately. Uh, different value investors do things in different ways. I don't think there's any particular mold that a value investor has to fit into. So it's nice to see people thinking about things differently. I think they're broadly right uh, about meta platforms. They feel the same way that I do and think this is a, a pretty good buy for April. But I think of things slightly differently to how they do, I think. So let's work our way through this one. Uh, so meta platforms does basically two things. It has its family of apps, which is the Facebook Blue app, uh, WhatsApp and Instagram. And it has Reality Labs, which is more or less all of its metaverse stuff. Uh, so, um, Let's go valuation first on this one then. I saved that to the end with Howden Joinery, but let's work backwards because that seems to be what's kind of catching people's eye at the moment. Market cap of about 622 billion. If you were to buy this company, you would pick up about 13.8 billion in debt and you would get about 16.6 .6 billion in cash. So cash higher than debt, that's a good sign. But it means that you would have an enterprise value, so market cap plus debt minus cash of about 619 billion. So just sort of, just slightly short of uh, 620. Uh, it produced just under 40 billion in cash flows uh, at the end of last year, which was strong stuff, which gets you a free cash flow yield today of about 6.32%. Using our kind of projections into the future, what happens over the next 10 years? Well, if we grow at about 2%, that gets you an average of a 7.3% return. 8% growth gets you a 9.1% return. 12% growth gets you to 11.08% return. Those, I think, are sort of reasonably conservative numbers, but uh, you can plug your own ones in there and see where that takes you. I think this is sort of reasonably attractive price-wise, but let's get with the big elephant in the room first then. Uh, the number of daily average users on Facebook is going down, or at least it was at the end of last quarter. Uh, the number of daily active users on Facebook, the, the app specifically, took a step 
back. Uh, I think that might not be the end of the world because there were some other things that were kind of compensating for that reasonably well. Average revenue per user was up and daily active people, which is the way they measure their users across the whole suite in the family of apps, uh, was also up. So, yeah, a bit of a step back from Facebook. There's always a question on Facebook about the number of fake accounts that are on there and the number of people that have more than one account and so on. So I, I sort of take the daily active users thing with a little bit of a pinch of salt, but it's not a number you want to see going backwards, certainly. The family of apps growth then might be starting to slow down. It's still growing, but the rate it's growing is slowing a little bit. I think at this price, though, we're reasonably OK if it grows kind of pretty much at all. There's a bit of a headwind coming from Apple, limiting the effectiveness of its advertising and its ability to mine its users' data. But I think that its kind of sheer size will keep it attractive to advertisers, even if it's not quite the, the uh, I suppose, super effective advertising uh, proposition it once was. It still reaches just an awful lot of people and I think more than any of its competition. Uh, Reality Labs, which is the other half of things, is losing money. It lost $3.3 billion last quarter. That's quite a lot. Um, it's not a huge amount on a company the size of Meta platforms. And here's where I come away from the other value investors a little bit. They seem to be thinking, well, look, at current prices, you basically get Reality Labs as a kind of free roll. The family of apps stuff is pretty much what you pay for, and it's worth what you pay for it. So Reality Labs is a kind of shot to nothing, uh, more or less. And it's quite nice to have a shot to nothing. Google has plenty of them. It has stuff like um, Waymo uh, as a self-driving thing, I think. Loads more kind of moonshots on the side of it. I really don't see it this way, uh, the way the other value investors see it here. I think two things. The first of all is it's not a free shot, because... Uh, losing 3.3 billion a quarter, uh, if we keep going like that, that is actively dragging things backwards. Uh, that is limiting our returns, and those returns are being generated by the family of app stuff. So I don't think it's a free shot, particularly. Uh, it's hard to evaluate, but it's costing us at the moment. It might pay off in the long term, that's absolutely true, but I'm not sure it's quite a kind of uh, yeah free roll in the way that some people seem to think it is. At least I don't see it that way. I also think that this matters more to meta platforms than a kind of nice moonshot free roll would matter like Waymo to Google or something like that. So I think that meta platforms has got itself committed to Reality Labs in quite a deep and important way. I think it's committed because, partly because it's changed its name to meta platforms. It's now going to be really hard to walk away from all this metaverse stuff. Mm. Um, partly because it's stuck quite a bit of money in investing into it. It's going to be hard to write that down. And partly because I think it's really important to the future of the family of apps stuff. So where I think about the family of apps and I think where Facebook has done really, really well, a lot of its success is the result of managing the way people have transitioned from using computers to smartphones. Facebook's app is on everybody's phone. Everyone looks at WhatsApp. Well, a lot of people look at WhatsApp. Uh, not sure whether you do or don't, Steve. I know you tend to swerve this company's products pretty well. Uh, but a lot of people are on Instagram. We have an Instagram on Play and FTSE and they manage a transition to smartphones really, really well. If this company is going to keep going and its family of app stuff is going to keep being the success it is at the moment, it's going to have to manage the next transition to whatever comes after smartphones to get in front of people. And I think the metaverse is their attempt to do that. And I think that has to work, basically. I think if it doesn't work very well, then the apps that we see on the phones are going to be significantly less valuable than they currently are. So... I think there's a lot more risk in this metaverse stuff than a lot of people think there is. There's definitely opportunity there. I don't have a strong view as to which way it's going to go, but I would be reasonably confident with the company having made this kind of transition before and taking the thing seriously. But I don't think it's the kind of free roll that the value investors that I've heard talking about this seem to have it down as. Um, so I think the price is right. Uh, I think this is a strong company. I think it will continue to generate good returns. I think it's going to be absolutely fine over 10 years, probably better than fine. That's why I'm interested in buying it. But I think that if you're investing in a company like this, this is one way you ought to be able to make the case for the opposition, at least as well as the opposition does. Uh, I'm not sure everything is quite as amazing as some value investors seem to think at the moment. Steve, where are you on this, if anywhere? Um, so I... Really, I'm nowhere, um, but I, I do think it's an interesting proposition. So I think you're right. Zuckerberg has realized that he needs a platform. Um, the platforms in Google and Apple that he thought were enable, enablers are essentially heading towards being disablers, which is which is bad for Facebook. Um, and it's sort of like whatever you think about Facebook, 
um, the Motoran has the ultimate line on this in that there are no new industries. There are just different ways of doing old ones. And Facebook is an advertiser. And if somebody's going to restrict the advertise, uh, their access to um, effective advertising um, and effective targeting, definitely, uh, that is a threat to Zuckerberg's business. So he needs to own the next platform. And he is betting big on that being Metaverse. Um, in whatever, I mean, I, I, I don't know about you, Steve. I don't. I can't even really visualize it at the moment. Um, he obviously has a, a stronger opinion of how that looks than than we do. Um, so, but there is a different solution, and I don't know whether you've ever come across it before, uh, Stephen. It's um, something that uh, quite a few of the um, the sell side advertisers have come together to make, and it's called um, UID two point Have you ever come across that? No, so I don't think I have. It's a replacement for the cookie system that we, we currently use at the moment, which is basically how we store browsing information and, and bits and pieces about each other that then get released to the advertisers. So Unified ID Solution 2.0, I think it was uh, headed up by the Trade Desk. And it's one of the reasons the Trade Desk is so egregiously priced is that they essentially have come up with this open source, immutable way of collecting the data differently to cookies. And that allows the user to have full access to what this um, what this protocol has stored against them and change trends and change privacy to, to, you know, to see fit. So for me, there is the potential that Zuck is almost panicking and trying to get this idea behind and racing to get the, the first platform across the, across the board when what he should really be doing is adopting UID 2.0 straight off the bat, which should help him out. And I was just looking down the list of people who've collaborated on it. AMC Networks, BuzzFeed, Los Angeles Times, Foursquare, um, Fubo, uh, OpenX, Magnite, Pubmatic, all companies. I think we've, we've spoke about the Washington Post. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of companies in there. Obviously, the Trade Desk headed it up as well. Um, mm. They're all advertisers or, 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 or companies that sell advertising, I think, with a little bit of a, more of a push. This is an easier and a cheaper uh, solution for Zuck's problems. That's interesting. Um, there's always the antitrust thing, of course, with Facebook and mm. waking their way into this kind of thing. It feels like there should be a way of doing it without kind of advertising, without, sorry, outright buying something. I sort of feel the way you do for what it's worth. I've never really got to the idea of thinking that Metaverse headsets and so on were really going to catch on in the way that kind of Zuck's um, advertising campaigns seem to think they will. I've kind of written that down in my mind as a way of thinking... There's lots of things I don't really kind of see in the same way. I mean, I would have asked pretty... I was what, I was the person back in sort of 2005, 2006 when I started going to uni saying, what exactly do I need Facebook for? Uh, hmm. I can send people pictures. Uh, I can send them messages. That's basically all it is, as far as I can tell. It's still basically all it is. Okay, it's got a marketplace on it, but so is eBay. Um, and it's a really interesting kind of... That's a really good example of a kind of classic network effect, mm -hmm. I guess, that you, you're on that just because other people are. It doesn't really do anything that you couldn't replicate with something like MySpace or whatever at the time, but it grows faster. Um, so I'll be interested to see how this metaverse stuff shakes out. I'm not entirely sure that I fully understood it for the moment. Um, mm -hmm. I am in the camp of people who thinks family of apps will continue to do fairly well. But I view this metaverse stuff as more of a threat than an opportunity. Uh, I kind of see it as both, but that would be where I worry more uh, hmm. from the Facebook side of things. Yeah, I'd agree with you with that. I think um, at the moment, it just seems like a, a giant fire to shovel money into. Um, but who knows what will come out the uh, the back of it. He, he definitely has a vision for what this is meant to be. And um, yeah, I guess at some point, when you when you invest in a company like Meta, you've kind of got to say he's had the vision before. Uh, he's had the vision with Instagram as well, to to some degree. Um, so, and he's had the the vision with WhatsApp. Although I think they probably haven't fully realised what WhatsApp could be in terms of generating revenue. Um, and I think there's still there. There's still a lot of things. For what it's worth, I, I think this these results, and I've told you this, Steve, are a blip. I think that uh, Facebook have been testing a lot of different things in which they haven't fully. Uh, realized how to how to advertise properly on top of them and that will come over time the, these results will be just a blip on the balance sheet um, but I think there's definitely worry in the metaverse uh, there's, there's definitely worry that they come up with something that people don't want 
Um, but like I say, investing in Meta, uh, if you're doing it for the Metaverse, I think that's the wrong reason to do it. Um, but at some point, you've you've got to trust Zuck and say, okay, let's see what you've got. Yep, or you at least need to think you're priced to have a go, I guess, which is mm. the way a lot of us are thinking at the moment. Okay, that's our show. Uh, we've had four stocks that we're looking at in April. Um, do let us know below if there's anything that you've got an eye on that you'd like us to have a look at or that you'd like to tell us about. We're always interested in what you guys are thinking is catching your eye at the moment and the investing opportunities that you're seeing. Do leave us a nice review on um, Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts from. Um, and we'll see you in the next episode.